In this video, we will cover the full Legal Library Pro platform. Before we get started, I'm going to show you where to access some additional tools that you might not know about or you might already just want to refresh you on where you would find those. Um, one thing that I do suggest doing before you do anything in our system, as always, is make sure that on the upper left hand side, it says welcome comma your name. If it does not say that, you will not have access to um, these additional tools that I'm going over now. So the first thing we're going to do is just preview the legal forms library tab. So once you click on that, a drop down will appear. The overview just gives you a little bit of information about the platform. Um, the Legal Library Pro login is where we'll log in later. The first thing I do want to show you is this list of contracts. Um, once I click on that, um, you'll see you're prompted to log in at the top. Or if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see some hyperlinks. Um, all of these hyperlinks are blank printable PDF versions of our forms. If you're not logged in, you'll simply see a list um, and you won't be able to click on those to open them. So keep that in mind. You can switch between our Washington forms and our Idaho forms. Um, as you go between these different tabs, you'll just uh, go through the different um, categories of forms that we have. And then, like I said, once you click on those hyperlinks, it'll render a blank printable PDF version of the form. This is also a great place to go if you do not currently know um, the information that's within each of our forms and you'd like to review them before adding them to your transactions. Um, you can always look at them here before you go in and do add those. Um, into your existing transactions later. I'm going to go ahead and just close this to go back to the, web, the website. Now that I've done that, um, again, I can scroll between these. I can go between Washington and Idaho, and every orange hyperlink is going to open just a PDF version of the form. I'm going to scroll up a little bit more so I can see our toolbar. Now when I click on the Legal Forms Library tab again, I can click on Training and Reference Guides. So we do offer a live webinar quarterly uh, for our Legal Library Pro platform, and you can register for that here. Um, we do offer individual and group trainings. We have a PDF how-to guide. What that how-to guide will cover is everything um, that we're covering today, just in a written format. If you'd like to see that, you can open that at any time. It's pretty long, um, but as you scroll down, it is separated into sections, so you can jump directly into what you would like to review. I'm going to go ahead and close this and go back to the website. This Legal Library Pro Tutorials and Recorded Webinar is likely where you open this from, um, but if you'd like to find a shorter version or just jump to what you need to review, you can. we do have that broken down into individual sections as well. Um, so you could jump directly into a specific part of this webinar. Now that we covered that, um, we do also have some tips and tricks on there for you to review. I'm going to go ahead and just scroll up again a little bit so we can see the legal library, legal forms library tab. Once I click on that, now I can log in. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into this legal library pro login. What that will do, it'll take us into the screen. Um, mine is auto filled in just because I have it saved. Um, if you don't have it, just keep in mind your login information is going to be the same as your login information for the SIBO website. And you can choose to remember me, which is what I have done here. Um, and then you do want to keep it defaulted to are you a SIBA member? Yes. Um, if you're not, a, or if you're sharing with a non-member, they do have uh, the option to click no, and then they'll have a way to log in. And we'll cover all of that process about adding those non-members in later. I'm just going to go ahead and click login. Now that I've logged in, it's taken me to my transactions page. Um, so you can see up here, um, there's boxes I can fill in. Um, those are not to create a new transaction. Those are to search through your existing transactions. So if I type in my buyer tenant name, it's going to search for anything that I have um, in that field over here. Then as I scroll down, um, everything in these gray boxes down here are my already existing transactions. They are automatically set to sort by the updated date. So anything you touch most recently is going to appear at the top. But you can click on any of these fields. And as you switch them, um, it's now going to sort by that method instead in either ascending or descending order. Um, how you choose to do that is up to you. But again, it is automatically defaulted to sort by um, most recently updated being at the top. I'm going to go back up to the top. And again, to create a new transaction, you don't fill these in. These are just search fields for your existing transactions. You'd want to jump directly into clicking new transaction. 
Once I click new transaction, I can see it's taken me into the trans create transaction screen and you've got some required fields here. Pretty much everything is required aside from your listing number and your suite number. If there's anything you don't have, you can put in TBDs or underscores until you do have that information ready to go. Um, so we'll just get started here. This transaction category, um, if you click on it, it'll start with you with no. Um, if your admins have set up transaction categories for you, you can populate that in there um, through the drop down below. It's not um, something you have to have. So if it says none, don't be concerned. That's um, how it's designed is just defaulting to none. The transaction type is just a sorting method. Um, so a way to jump to um, your purchase and sell or your lease or your business opportunity um, transactions. But keep in mind, even if you pick, you know, like business opportunity here, you would still have access to the forms in the other categories. I'm going to go ahead and just click listing. Um, and again, the listing number is not required. Buyer and tenant name is required. Um, but if it is a listing, you might not have that information. So you could always put TBD or under sorry, underscores, just placeholder information, whatever you want to put there is up to you. Um, we typically use TBD and underscores as placeholders, but again, totally up to you. You put your seller landlord in there. And then the address. And then I didn't finish filling anything in everything in. I want to show you what it looks like if you don't have that done. So now when I go to hit save, I can see that there's required information still in there that I've not yet done. So I'll need to go back in and populate that. And then this is where it does matter. Um, if you do select Idaho here, you will only have access to the Idaho forms. If you select Washington, you will only have access to the Washington based forms. Um, so be careful there. I'm just going to select Washington, give it a county, and then a zip code. Now that I've done that, when I go to hit save, it'll take my information and now it's created my new transaction for me and take me into my transaction detail page. And this is where you'll do any work to your transaction. So like I said, we did put placeholders in for my buyer and tenant name, but maybe as your transaction changes, you get that information and you can edit that at any time as long as the top bar is orange and says transaction detail. Um, you can go ahead and hit this edit button here. So now that I've hit edit, it takes me into my edit transaction screen and I can see I can make some changes here. So let's say I did get that buyer and tenant name so I can update that. And all of these are auto-populated fields. So if there was a spelling error, that's where you would make the change to those auto-populating fields. Um, if you have an office logo, it should be here. If we don't have one for you, you can always email us at the SEBA staff and we can get that uploaded for you. Another great thing about the Legal Forms platform is if there is a secondary logo that you would prefer to use, you can also send that over to us and we can add it to your account and you'd be able to find it in this drop-down menu here under Use This Instead. I'm going to go ahead and save my changes. Now that I've saved my changes, my buyer tenant name is there. And now we can move on with the rest of the transaction detail page. So this top part here is about adding users. So the system is designed to be collaborative. And we'll go over that process of adding users a little bit later. Just wanted to let you know that we do have that there and we will be covering it. The next part is documents, um, and that is what we'll cover next. But then the last part of this uh, transaction detail page is attachments. So if you have any PDF or images that you'd like to add, you can include them as attachments. Again, that's another topic we'll be covering as well. So the first thing we're going to cover once we've created our transaction is now going about adding documents. So once you click this Add Documents button, a pop-up uh, window should appear the full list of all of our documents. Um, you can't view the documents in their entirety. You can preview the first page. Um, so once I hit view page one, it'll show me that there. Again, if you'd like to preview the full document before you add it to your transaction, um, going through the main page and the legal library tab and that um, list of contracts is gonna be the best place to go about doing that. I'm gonna hit done there. So that's how you preview it. Um, you've got a few ways to search here. Um, if you want to search by the document name contains, maybe you know the name of the document. Um, you could type in um, like agreement 
And then once I type in agreement and I hit search, any document name that contained agreement is going to appear in my list down below. I'll take that out. And then the next method that you can sort by is um, choosing just to look at the documents in a specific category. Um, so this was a listing. So maybe I'll just click listing forms and then search. I do have quite a few items on my list, um, and so this is something that you'll want to keep in mind, is that your office does have the capability to create a template um, that's designed specifically for your office. Um, so make sure that when you're checking, you're selecting the correct one, um, be it if it's a master office, if it's the master template, so the SEBA template, or the office approved templates that, or the office created templates that you've your office has made, um, you'd be able to see um, which kind of template it was and it will give you a little brief description so you're able to select the correct, correct ones. I'm going to go back and just go to any and then I will switch it to master um, so that we can kind of start from scratch. We'll give it a second. There we go. And then I'm going to go ahead and select the forms that I want to add to this test transaction. Um, so I know I want a lease agreement. Let's just do this one. And then if I go back, I saw the addendum. Uh, I'm just going to add those two forms. So as I select my forms, um, this number is going to up update however many forms I've selected. So now that I've selected two, it'll say two selected. I'll click add documents. When that two goes down to zero, I know my documents have been added to my transaction and I can go up to the top and click done. Now that I've done that, I can see the two, two um, forms that I've added to my transaction appear in my documents section now. And now I can get started with editing them. I'll start with this um, multi-tenant triple net lease. Um, in order to fill out and edit the document, you can see that my auto populated fields have filled in here. Um, so those are gonna be the items that were edited in the um, transaction detail. And when I created my transaction, you can see up at the top, um, this blue bar now, or the bar is now blue and says document detail instead of being orange and saying transaction detail. If you click the edit button here, Again, you cannot edit your auto-populated fields. It's only going to be a place where you would uh, add a document note. Um, one great thing about that document note is maybe you have a few versions of the same form um, and you just want to know which form it is that you're working on. Perhaps it's multiple addenda that you have in there. You can add a note about which either of those is. I don't need to add a note. I'm just going to go ahead and hit save here and that'll bump me back into my document preview. Um, the proof Print preview is just going to um, render a PDF version of the form, which I am going to do, but I'll do that down here. Now that I've done that, I can view the form in its entirety. It shows me all 27 pages. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go back, and then I'm going to get started with filling out the document. So I'm just going to fill out document. Keep in mind, 90% of what you're going to do on these forms is going to be just in this fill out document section. Um, it's really nice and easy. It lets you um, just fill in what you need to. So I'm just going to put in some test. Okay, and I've added my text in there and then I can hit save. Once I do that, I can see my changes have been saved. Um, they've been added there. And now when I go back to my rendered PDF, I can refresh and see how my text appears within my document. So you can see here's the text that I added. Um, even though I did add line breaks when I was typing it, it does appear and those are now filled in and underlined. Um, so you can see how that looks and adjust it as you need to in there. Go back to my fill out document. And the next thing that I wanna show you in this fill out document screen is that, um, like I mentioned, the system is designed to be collaborative. So you can invite users in, which again, we'll be covering later. But as you're making changes, everything is tracked in the system. So when I click this little down arrow, it's gonna tell me when the item was changed, what number of change it was, and who made the change. And I'm able to replace that and revert it back to any information that was previously in there. So now I've gone back to none. It's removed that 27 for me. 
So any change that is made in here, you will be able to see and you're not stuck with it. Um, so that's really great. And we do have a second report that also just shows you all of those changes that we'll cover um, when we go over printing documents later. But this is um, one place that you can go through and track and make sure that everything's in there is exactly how you want it and nothing's been changed without your knowledge. I'm going to go ahead and hit done um, to get back to the main page. I will discard my changes. I just wanted to show you what that looks like. And now the next thing that we're going to go over is going to be our modified document. Um, so this is the only reason you would ever want to go into the modified document screen is if you do want to make changes to the boilerplate text. So I'm going to go ahead and hit modify document. Um, this page can be really overwhelming because um, every single line is its own box um, and every single paragraph is going to have another box. So one thing we do advise you to keep in mind is as long as you know um, what a button or selection is in one section, you'll know where, what it is for the rest of them. Um, so we'll just kind of preview what those are now. So anywhere you see a circle plus, it's going to be to add a component, depending on where you are in the form, um, that name of what you're adding is going to be different. So up top, this is the header. So you'd be adding a header component. And this add component that's outside of any box is going to be just adding a component to the full document. And then as you get in between these dotted lines here, when you go to those little circle pluses, it's now going to be to add a paragraph component. Um, so again, depending where you're at in the form, and which um, kind of box area you're in, what you're adding or where you're adding a component is going to change. Um, just like on the um, fill out document, any of these down arrows are going to be show details and that allows you to see all the changes that have been made in your document, allow you to go back and revert to a previous version. Um, here you can increase or decrease the header font. Um, here you can edit a text line. The X's are going to delete the text line. And then again, add a component over here, remove a line break. Um, so that's kind of what those mean. Um, so now that we've kind of previewed those, I'll show you what they actually mean and we'll start working on them. The first one I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and when I click on edit text line, what that's going to do is turn it into a text box and I can make changes to this boilerplate text. So if I want to add language, I would just go over like adding. Well, language. I can also change the um, way the font is appearing. So if I highlight a specific section, I can then make it bold. I can underline it. I can italicize it. And then when I go to hit save, it's going to look like this little floppy disk. Once I hit save, I can see my changes have been made. Um, because I did add text, it's showing my added language in all capital letters there. Um, you should also keep in mind that um, it looks like I created new or that I struck, struck through new text based on where I put it in. Um, so any language that you remove from the text boxes will be stricken through um, because it is boiler. the boilerplate is approved by our attorneys. You can't remove that information entirely. Um, so keep that in mind. Anything that's quote unquote being deleted is actually just going to appear stricken through um, when you render the PDF. And I'll show you that down here as well. So let's say maybe I don't want this. Um, list item, I can go ahead and hit the X on the far right and it's removed that entire list item. Um, so that part of my paragraph is a list. Now, when I go to my rendered PDF and I refresh it, all the changes that I've made will appear here and you'll be able to see those font changes. So you can see anything that's been changed will appear in red or blue writing in this um, proof version of it. And then um, the added language is all gonna be capitalized. And just some things to keep in mind there. I'm going to go ahead and go back to my modified document screen. And that's kind of the basics on making changes to your text. Um, again, just like on the um, fill out document, anytime you hit the show details, it'll show you any changes that have been made, who made the changes, and you can revert back to a previous version. If you made a mistake in removing text and you want to add it back in, you can click this little kind of um, almost full circle with the arrow. It looks like the refresh button. And if you click that, it'll undelete the item for you and add all of that language back in. And then we can go through adding some components. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and click on this little add component here. You can see I can add a new paragraph, I can add a section, I can add a table, I can have a list, I can add a page break. 
But what instead of doing a full component, I'm going to add one to our paragraph and I'm going to go to this one. And now that I'm in my add paragraph component, I can add a new text line, can add a line break. I can add data entry lines, check boxes, clauses, uh, transaction images or transaction info. And then I'm going to go ahead and just do a text line. And now that I've added that, this is my new text. Can go ahead and save and now my new text has been added you can see that it's all in capital letters and that proof it will be blue that's the basics on adding text um, and things like that to your transaction the next thing we're going to go over before we finish with this modify section is we're going to go about adding attachments i did not add an attachment to begin with um so i'm going to go ahead and go back um to the transaction details so i'm just going to hit done and then that takes me back to my document detail Done one more time will take me into transaction detail. And here we are in transaction details. And I can click add new attachment. In this add attachment section, I can add photo images. I can add um, other documents. I can add PDF files. Um, but one thing that you should keep in mind when you are adding an attachment, if your intention is to embed that attachment, it does need to be an image file type not embed a document into a document, but you can embed an image. So like a JPEG or a PNG. Um, if your file is not one of those formats, you can convert that on your own. And then once that's been converted, you will be able to embed that, um, but just keep that in mind. And the first step for embedding an image is first to browse your computer for the image. Um, so once I click on that, it'll take me in there. Here's the test image I wanna do. Now that I've added my image name, I can add a note to self. And then I can go ahead and hit save. Once I save that, it'll take me into my attachment details. If I click on this hyperlink for the file name, it'll allow me to preview the image that I've added. I can close that and then hit done. Okay, now that I have added my attachment, um, I'm as an image, I can go about embedding it into my document. Typically, we get users who would like to embed images as a part of their exhibit. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and do that into our um, the multi-tenant triple nest lease that I've been working on. Um, so again, I can't go into fill out document to do it. I will need to go into modify document. Once I do that, I can then scroll up to the image that I would or to the section that I would like to add, or I can simply click Control F and then type in exhibit. Once I do that, it'll jump me into there. I'm gonna go ahead and just do it um, in exhibit C. Um, so now I can see um, as far as, as again, as long as you're in these little dotted lines, um, you'll be adding a paragraph component, which is what we would, what we would like to do. I'm gonna go ahead and add paragraph component. I typically like to insert a line break so then my image will appear on the next line. If I don't start with doing that, the transaction image will appear directly to the right of the work letter text. So I'm gonna show you what both of those looks like in our rendered PDF. So I'm just gonna go ahead and hit transaction image. Once I do that, I can choose from the drop dropdown. Um, I have this test image to embed. I can keep it at the actual image size or reduce it to the size of the a percentage of the paragraph width. I'm gonna go ahead and just hit save. And I'm going to go back up to our rendered PDF. I'm going to refresh that. And then I'm going to scroll to our exhibit. Now I've scrolled down, I can see um, that um, it does appear because it was larger. It didn't appear directly next to the work letter, but I'll still show you what will happen once I add in an additional line break. So I would go in front of the transaction image or behind the work letter, and I can hit add paragraph component, line break. I'm going to go ahead and refresh that again so you can see what that change looks like. I've made the change as I go down. I can now see there's a little bit more space between um, the work letter and my transaction image. Um, and then again, I could reduce the size of that image if I'd like, or if you needed to make it larger, you could do that with that percentage um, just by going back into the modify screen, clicking the edit um, image attachment. And then you can play with those um, two options there to see which looks best within your own forms. Now that we've gone through um, the process of embedding images, let's say I'm done with my document. I just want to make sure to hit save on whatever my last change in my modify document screen was and then go up to the top and hit done. Once I've then hit done, I have some options here on my document preview. 
I can choose to do the proof, which means my changes that I've made appear in blue text. If I choose to do final, that'll change the text into um, black font. And then the last option here is this revisions. Uh, once I look at my revisions report, it's going to track any changes that I've made, give them a number, and then I'm able to see all of those side by side. I'm going to go ahead and just do this preview for us so you can see what that looks like. So you can see it's clearly labeled revisions. It gives a number to every change that I've made. And then when I go to the bottom, it tells me every um, change that was made during the process, who made it and when it was made. Um, so this is great if you are working with someone else, you are able to see all of those changes in one place. I'm gonna go ahead and hit done or close both of those and then go back to my document detail. And then I'm gonna go ahead from here and we're just gonna hit done one more time. And if you wanted to print several documents at once, you would simply do print documents. Once you choose to print the document, you would select the documents you want. I'm gonna go ahead and include um, both of the ones. I'll go ahead and hit print again. I did keep them in proof. So again, that just means the text is blue. And um, when you do print documents from the screen, they don't jump directly into printing. What they do is actually download as a zip folder on your computer. And then once those um, documents have been saved in that zip folder, you can then print them. Um, so you can either save and then print or you can print directly from the document detail pages. I'm gonna go ahead and just hit cancel. Don't need to do anything else with that. We don't need to preview those. So that's the basics on going through um, and making changes on your own. But the next thing that I do wanna show you is again, like I mentioned before, the system is designed so that it can be a collaborative effort for you. So you can invite other users in and we'll go through that process. So you wanna to go to the transaction users tab and click that little drop down. You would see your name as the only transaction user when you get started, but then you can hit this invite user button here. If your other user is a SEBA member, you can search for their office. I'm going to type in Kidder so I can show you something. So you can see we have quite a few different Kidder offices. Um, in order to make sure that you're adding the user in the appropriate office, if you hover over each of those names, it'll tell you what city um, that particular office is in. So if you had a user that was in the Kidder office in Seattle, you would want to click one of the Seattle offices. Um, there's not many that have multiple like that, but you just need to make sure you're clicking on the right one. I'm going to go ahead and actually take that out. I just wanted to show you how you would go about doing that. And instead, I'm going to keep the SIBA office and I'm going to go ahead and add myself. So as I start typing in the address um, for the user that is in the SIBA office, I'll see the drop down with anything matching. So keep in mind that if you are using, um, if you are adding a SIBA member from a different office, make sure to select the correct office and then use the email address that's attached to their SIBA account. Once you do that and you click on it, it should populate with their first and last name, and then you can assign them a maintenance level or a user, um, a type of user level. So transaction user just means that the user has access um, to everything in the transaction, so all of your documents. Um, and you can choose to give that user just a view only access or a fill out and edit access. Maybe you just want your client to be able to see the documents, you can do it that way. Or if you're working with another broker or someone else in your office, you can also give them fill out and edit access. And then document user just simply means um, that you would assign the user access to only specific documents of your transaction. So you can assign them one, or maybe you just don't want them to see one. You can assign them everything but that last document. And then the last user type here um, that's available is going to be transaction maintenance. Keep in mind, in order to be a transaction maintenance user, the user does have to be an active SEBA member in your same office, and that gives them the same access level as you. Um, so typically, you wouldn't add someone else with transaction maintenance unless you did want them to have full access to everything like you do. Um, and then the last kind of feature that you have available here is to do a non-member. So if there's a non-member, um, that you need, I'm gonna go ahead and take out my information, should remove it. And now when I click non-member, I can fill in um, this information here. So if I did, um, just do my personal email. So I start typing in my email. If I've added them before, it'll appear in this list down below. If they are not yet invited to any transactions, this information will auto populate and it'll um, need you, it'll require you to fill in their name and their phone number. Once you hit, um, again, you have to give them an access level. 
I'll just do that one. And then I can send my user invitation. Once I send it, it lets me know that it's been sent and I can hit okay. And then I can hit done at the top. And now in my transaction users, that new um, user that I added appears in that list down below. And I can see um, that I am a transaction user with fill out and edit access, but I do not have that transaction maintenance level because um, I didn't assign it. But that's the basics on adding users. Again, um, it is designed to be collaborative, but you don't have to invite anybody else. It's just if you want them to be able to fill out and edit those documents with you. Otherwise, you don't have to go about adding any users at all. So that covered the basics on using the Legal Library Pro platform. The next thing we're going to cover are some more advanced time-saving steps that you have available to you within the platform. The first one I'm going to go over is how to go ahead and copy a saved transaction. You might want to do this if you have another transaction coming up that pretty much mirrors a previous one. You can copy over your documents. You can even copy over any changes you made within, to the, within those documents. Um, and you can do that directly from this transaction detail page here. Just um, hit this, uh, it looks like two pieces of paper. If you hover, it'll say copy to new transaction. Once I click that, it'll open up for me and then I can choose which information I do wanna copy over. So maybe my buyer tenant is the same or my seller landlord or the address. You can just hit set to copy um, from property address. So that'll be the information from the original transaction. And then I can just call this new So to distinguish between the two, I did give this one a different name. So I just call it new transaction buyer slash tenant name um, as opposed to buyer slash tenant from the previous transaction. Once I filled in the transaction details, I can then go in to copy my documents. If I would like to copy them all over, I would select this checkbox here, or maybe there's just one or two I wanna copy over. I'll do that by selecting only the ones I want on the left. If there's changes that I'd like to copy over, like maybe I want to copy over my revisions and attachments, I would want to check that. And then if you wanted to copy over any of your fill it in information, you'll also want to copy include filled out fields and that'll just copy everything over for you. Um, if you have attachments that you'd like to also um, move over as well, just select from there. Once I've got all of that information saved, I can go ahead and hit copy transaction. It'll give me a moment to wait. I can see my new transaction or my copy. The transaction's been copied. So it's copied transaction up at the top. One thing to keep in mind when you are copying your transactions is that any revisions and attachments that have been made prior to copying your transaction will be timestamped with the date and time of the original change. I'll show you what that looks like here. Go into this multi-tenant triple net lease. Once I get there, I can see my document detail. I'll go into fill out document. I'll find a fill in field. Um, and then I'm gonna go ahead and just hit the show details button. And you can see the time and date on this timestamp was from the time and date that the original change on the document was made. This isn't a big deal. Only people who have access to fill out and edit um, your documents will see this. But if that's information you do not want someone else to notice or see, um, we do suggest that instead of copying the transaction, you just recreate it with a new one and fill in those details again on that new document. Um, so those timestamps don't um, impact your transaction in any way. Now that we covered the first time saving step of copying a transaction, we're gonna go over the next one, which is gonna be in the templates um, versus the transactions section. And under templates, you now have access to add clauses or templates. And essentially what that is, is if you know that you add the same language into all of your documentation, going into templates, or creating a template or creating a clause to add into one of your uh, documents, it's going to save you a lot of time rather than having to type it or copy and paste it every time. Um, so once you click on templates, you can choose between clauses or templates. I selected templates already. And here you can see all of our master and our office templates. So the master are going to be the SEPA documents. Um, what you would do from there is you would select the document that you want to make your changes on. I'm just going to go ahead scroll over. The computer is running a little bit slow today. Let's just do this lease addendum. Um, it's a little bit shorter. You can see all of the changes that you want to make um, a little bit easier than when you add it to other documents. So once you select the document you'd like, you can preview that first page and then you would hit this again. It looks like the two papers if you hover it on, I'll say copy template. I'm going to copy my template. 
From there, I can, um, it's attached to my office automatically and then I can give it a description. So I'm just saying this is for our webinar template. I'm gonna go ahead and copy the template. Now that I'm in here and I've uh, made the decision to copy my template, I can choose to edit template content. Once I do that, it opens to a screen very similar to the modified document content. And then you would just want to scroll to the section that you're wanting to make changes on. Um, so maybe instead of wanting to do it as a fill and fill, I can add a text line. And I'm just going to add in some text so we can see what that looks like when we save it. I've added in my text. I'll go ahead and hit save just like I do on the modified document when I'm adding text in. It's now saved my changes in the capital blue letters that we saw before on the modified document. I can then hit done at the top. I can see that this is just a draft and it's not yet been published. So then I would want to go up to edit on the template detail. I switch it from draft to published and then I can hit save. Keep in mind, once you've published your um, te your templates, you're not going to be able to go in and edit them. So you can see that edit template content has been grayed out. Um, you would want to um, copy that template over and then make any changes that you need to and then resave everything. And that's the first um, section of the templates. The clauses is going to be pretty similar, um, but this would be if instead of wanting to add language to every single um, document as you would with the template moving forward, maybe it's just language that you add into a lot of documents or you might add in sometimes and it's easier um, to just paste it where you need to. Instead of clicking templates under the template tab, you then select clauses. So you can see we don't have a lot of clauses in my office yet. You would see all of your office clauses here. Um, you can search for any existing clauses up top, just like you can on the transactions. It's just searching through your existing clauses. If you don't have any yet, um, don't be alarmed. It is a newer feature. But to add a clause, you would just simply click new clause up here. You'll want to give it a name. I just called it our pre-recorded webinar clause. Um, it's gonna add some test clause and fill lines. Now that I've added that, I can then either leave it as a draft and save it, or I can publish it and save it. I'm gonna go ahead and just publish it um, so that we can move forward with pushing it through on some test documents. I'm gonna go ahead and save my published um, clause. Now that I've done that, I can see my language has been added. It says the name, what date it was published, who it was published by. I can copy the clause if I need to make changes to it. I'm gonna go ahead and hit done here. I can see my class has been added. Now when I go back into my transactions, I'll open um, the new transaction we made. Now I've done that, I can add my documents. So we're gonna just add um, the template that we made. So instead of being on all and master, I'm gonna switch it over to office. Now I've switched it over to office. I can see, I can look for it. Um, easy to remember the document short name if you did. I can also see my office template description. I know that I called it our pre-recorded webinar template. I'd select it on the left, go up to the top. I see that I've added or I've selected one, click add document. Once that one goes down to zero, I can then hit done up at the top. Now that I've hit done, I see that my new lease addendum template has been added. So I click on that and open it. My added language is already in there. If I go into fill out document, it's locked. So I would have to go into modify document and then I can edit that information here. Now, when I go to my clauses, I'll also wanna be in this modify document section. I'll go ahead and hit um, add paragraph component. Once I hit add paragraph component, I can see clauses available. I'm gonna click on clause. It's gonna have a drop down menu and I can select the clause that I wanna add in. I see I have two. I selected my pre-recorded webinar clause. I'm going to insert the clause here. Now my clause has been added and it did include my line breaks that I added in there. Once I hit done and I go to that um, document detail page, I can see that both my template text is in here and my added clause is in here. Um, I'm going to go back to modify document. If any time you want more spaces, um, you would just hit this little add paragraph component between the two. 
and then I can add line breaks. And those are just some additional time-saving steps that you have within the Legal Library platform. Um, and you can use those or not use those at any time. Whatever works best for you works great for us. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to our team. Thank you.